Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Paolo Drinot. I'm uh, going to be chairing this um, evening's lecture, which is um, the Lever Hume Trust Visiting Professor lecture that uh, Ricardo Lopez Pereiros is uh, has kindly agreed to um, to give. So I will introduce the speaker very briefly and then hand over uh, to him. Uh, I, I think he will speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or something like that. Um, and then there'll be time for a Q&A session, uh, which I will, I will chair. Uh, at that point, if you have a question, either use the raise hand function or if you prefer, write your question in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, so it's a real pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Ricardo Lopez Pedreros, who is a professor of history at Western Washington University and currently Lieberhume Trust visiting professor at the UCL Institute of the Americas. Um, during his stay at UCL, um, Ricardo has taught uh, a course on the history of neoliberalism in Latin America and undertaken research um, for uh, a number of different projects, including uh, the research that he's going to be talking about today. Uh, Ricardo is the author of Makers of Democracy, a transnational history of the middle class classes in Colombia, published by Duke University Press in 2019, and the uh, Spanish translation I think is, is out or is imminent from Universidad del Rosario. He is co-editor of The Making of the Middle Class Towards a Transnational History, published also by Duke University Press in 2012, and a new volume titled The Middle Classes in Latin America, Subjectivities, Practices, and sorry, Genealogies, which is forthcoming from Routledge. He is also the editor of a book series um, titled Social Movements in the Americas. And he's currently writing a biography of Colombian sociologist, Gabriel Restrepo. So his talk today is titled America and the Elites Without History. Now over to you, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulo. And thank you everyone for um, coming, for participating in this you know, talk. I of course want to you know thank the uh, the Leverhome Trust for the uh, the opportunity and the for the financial support for the last you know um, months of my stay here at UCL. I also want to thank my my colleagues at the institute for the hospitality and you know for the discussions and the the the, the debates about you know um, ideas. Uh, I also want to, you know, thank Oscar for organizing this um, event. So um, let me let me start, you know, sharing my screen here, really quick. You're gonna, oops, let me see. This is you know, the end. I don't want you to see that. Just want to see this one right here. Um, so I hope everybody's seeing my screen, right? Is that you know correct? Just somebody can actually tell me that that's the yes, case. Yes. All right. Thank you. So um, um, so this this research, which as you will see at this point, you know, I have more you know questions than you know answers, is you know the product of at least you know two questions I often receive um, as intellectual reflex when I say I'm interested in studying the elites in Latin America. On the one hand, in a context in which, as uh, Tony Morrison argued a few years back, our fears uh, have been all serialized, our creativity discipline, if not censor, and our dear marketplace, history of elites as elites are seen as passe, and fruitful topic, and above all, an unmarketable topic in unison, um, I am often told the grand narratives of domination and elite formation have been amply and excessively told. They are the winners of history. Um, 
don't I, don't I know you know this? So they tell me, let's study something new and more important. Um, and then there is another response, um, precisely as a result of the first one, historians and scholars turn you know, quickly and um, assertively to study the multiple forms of resistance, agency, inclusion, and appropriation by those we assume we have been historically marginalized, the subaltern broadly understood. I have always wondered how is it that we propose to study either up or write histories from below? From what position we define the up and the below of society? Don't we assume the historical constitution of a social hierarchy in the very way we approach our topics of research? It is, is it perhaps that because we scholars enjoy a hierarchical distribution of class privilege that invite us, invite us in an unconscious way, I'm sure, to take the scripts of domination for granted? Where do this unconscious defensive, defensiveness um, that tell us we know how domination wars come from? And here I take inspiration on Michel Trio, who asked in a brilliant book, I would return this you know, uh, to the previous slide in a moment, in a brilliant book that I'm sure most of us are familiar with, Silence in the Past. He writes, what makes some narratives, and in my case, I would add the stories about the elite, um, more powerful than other, or powerful enough to pass as accepted Histories as accepted history, if not historicity itself. In this framework, we tend to assume the elites as a structure and subaltern as agency, as resistance. In the process, I would argue, domination become an abstraction. And if I want to be at least, you know, provoke today. Uh, some question is precisely, you know, try to be more concrete about what we mean by, you know, domination and elite, you know, formation that we often cite and mobilize, but we seldom specify. Um, the second question that, you know, um, Trio ask is, you know, the following, and it's indeed a, you know, question that come from you know, the, the very same you know, idea of you know, why do we actually have to study the elites? He, um, he asked, the elites are the witness of history, but if history is merely told the story, if history is merely told by those who won, how did they win in the first place? And why don't all the winners tell the same story. Although I will not be able to elaborate all the points that I would like to um, in this presentation, I only have 40, you know, 40 minutes and I struggle a lot to exclude so many things. I like to say at, you know, at the outset that the fundamental premise of my current research is, as Anne Lord Stoller has proposed, to have at least a sure intellectual reflex to study power and perhaps to slow down reasoning so that we can historicize the multiple and contradictory forms of domination during the second half of the 20th century in the, in the Americas. My focus is indeed on Colombia in a transnational framework, but I like to think that there is a larger question here, an effort to think again grand narrative, the ones that we you know, think that they are so passe, to explain why and how neoliberalism as a structural change, as a political economy, as a discourse, as a violent practice and a subjective habitus has become the dominant political inspiration to organize society, even in those systems that claim to overcome that such system. So, and here again, I wanna warn you that I'll be mostly, you know, be asking, you know, question. So, um, 
let me then you know describe what I want to do for the rest <laughs> of the of the uh, presentation. Um, I already you know explain why why the elites. Uh, I want then you know follow some you know stories of you know three members of you know the elites. I'm gonna ask some you know the main questions, and then I'm gonna move to the description of certain narratives that are the product of you know transnational knowledge discussion that has actually led us you know scholars to dismiss you know the elites or to think as the title of my presentation suggests to see elites without history but before you start you know telling me like you know how in the world you're making that argument that elites do not have history as true you know as we i just said like oh you know elites are the winners of history what i want to you know show you know here is how we create certain you know categories in which we actually, you know, say, oh, let's leave the elites alone. And then, you know, I'm gonna actually you know, make some arguments uh, as to why it is important to study the elites instead of taking granted, you know, for granted that that's indeed, you know, you know the case. So um, let me start with some stories. Um, I guess, you know, as a historian, that's what we actually, you know, have to do that, you know, these, you know, three stories of, you know, a, uh, oops, I forgot to put my, you know, hey, all right, a, um, a retired, the story of a retired lawyer, a part of, you know, a bureaucratic elite um, a, um, from a Bogota, a, an industrialist, um, manufacturer, that you could actually say is part of you know the old money, also part of you know the elite, and a businesswoman who is a CEO, part of you know the commercial elite, you know the financial elite. Um, she is a CEO in a bank. A, um, in the context of a social polarization created in part by Alvaro Uribe Vélez regime and the peace process between the FARC, the guerrilla, and the government in 2019. A political you know, polarization that is still very much with us, given what happened on Sunday. Uh, I interviewed these, you know, three members of the elite. They considered themselves part of the elite. There was no, you know, doubt, you know, about, you know, that that was the case. Although, you know, the language of the middle classes was also, you know, present, and I'd be more than happy to talk about that in a Q and A. So they say, the history of Colombia is characterized by decades of endless economic possibilities and contest quest for success. Colombia, they insisted, is not, and I quote, violence, hunger, drugs, or lawlessness, but rather opportunity, economic success, and democracy. They assured me that history of Colombia was not violent at all. And if there was violence by elites, they, as elites, were not like that. They were different. Violence was deception rather than the rule. They complained, in fact, they complained, in fact, that the stories had been ignored in favor of those about, and I quote, peasants, poor people, labor classes, violence, what had been bad about Colombia. In their multiple trips abroad, they recall encountering, and I yet again quote, uh, people from foreign countries who look surprised to see people like them because people in other countries think all of us here in Colombia are very poor, shabby, pobretones, sarapatrosos, wearing alpargates, you know, sandals, which is a sign of, you know, associated with, you know, indigenous identity. They also say these people in other countries, particularly in Europe, in Europe or the United States, don't know that there are also white people in Colombia and that Colombia is a mestizo society. They start narrating that you know, professionals' lives and they can argue that Colombia society did not follow. Close the door. Oops. No, no, no. Patricio, can you turn the you know, mic off, please? <laughs> oh, wait. Okay, so 
a, um, they, they say that, you know, countries like, you know, um, Colombia or unlike other countries in Latin America, they had a, you know, uh, they never had a dictatorial past and that Colombia was the greatest democracy in Latin America. They remember their life through market-driven language, productivity, profit profitability, efficiency, individual effort, and competition to legitimize class privilege, economic status, racial hierarchies, and gender decisions that they say had secured by the 21st, um, uh, by the first decade of the first, you know, 21st you know, century. In particular, Barbara Vega, the retired lawyer, said that you know, this political radicalization of the 1970s, 1960s and 1970s were not you know, part of you know, the stories. She wanted me to know that you know, her story was all about you know, economic progress. Society, the abstraction that Vega often evoked to describe both a hierarchy of historical actors and a democratic market opportunity ensure that people got what they deserve. If one worked hard, society, again, that abstraction, make sure you will succeed. At the end of our conversation, she say the following. That always be, there will always be inequality in democracies. There may be people who are happy with less. Maybe there are people who are, you know, happy with more. Why do I have to decide what they want? That is indeed authoritarian, she said. That is the beauty of, the, of democracy, she continued, that everyone can decide what they want to do. Eso es lo hermoso de la democracia, she concluded. The businesswoman, Patricia Cifuente, echo similar view of democracy. And I quote, my life experience showed, showed this. Capitalism led you to be innovative. Prosperity is a blessing. If you wanna be a billionaire, you can do it. Is that bad? And the industrialist Alejandro Forero, Forero only added, democracy means the willingness to become somebody in life from bring nobody to become somebody. It is always to become better than the day before, but not just for the sake of being rich. Democracy is a system that puts people in its place according to what they need. Cada uno está en el lugar que se merece. That is democracy, and it takes a lot of balls to succeed in life. If people like me are not what democracy should be, then I have no clue what democracy is, and I have no clue what my life has been for the last 70 years. Certainly, one may easily debunk the veracity of these memories, these stories and histories. One could actually you know, easily say that, of course, Colombia is a history about it. One could also point out the contradictions of class status, gender subjectivities, and racialized privilege. And I am sure somebody would actually tell me this is indeed the evidence of the perennial transhistorical colonial matrix of power. They will remind me and criticize me for ignoring that that's indeed the case. These stories they would tell me would actually you know, prove that the, the so-called colonial matrix of power does exist. One could actually you know, say or dismiss these stories as the quintessential manifestation of elitism. And before you accuse me of being elitist, let me say, yes, these stories are elitist of you know, people who are elitist. Or in the language of you know, class in Colombia, arribistas. By now, there is plenty of a statistical work to provide, you know, to prove that inequalities do exist. And in fact, Colombia is one of the most unequal societies in the world. Um, I, yeah. and, and, and all of this is indeed you know, crucial, all the aspects that I just mentioned. But I argue that it's far more important to ask how and why these historical actors seem eager, if not obliged, to remember the past in a certain form. 
celebrating individual entrepreneurship and legitimizing class privilege as democratic prerogative while erasing politics altogether from their class racialized and gender realities. Their memories and their stories are defined by neither an obliviousness regarding class hierarchization, gender distinctions of racial hierarchies, nor a lack of awareness regarding their own position in a vertically defined society. Quite the opposite, quite the opposite. These hierarchies were worshiped precisely because for them, the equivalence between democracy or the definition of democracy and class position was indeed common sense. Gender categorization, hierarchical class, hierarchy class status, privileged access to education, white mestizo identity, labor exploitation, and material capital were all keenly celebrated as self-evident in these obvious and fetishized privilege and within a democratic system. Above all, they see violence either as necessary or squarely outside their class formation. But they do, um, they do a great amount of political work to occupy a privilege in a legitimate way. That is to say, as morally okay and even ethically necessary. But precisely because we tend to assume the historical scripts of domination and then resort back to predictable stories with familiar plots, we miss perhaps a crucial question. We as scholars assume wealth and wealth concentration is immoral. But in doing, the, in doing that, we sidestep the very moral economy, the practices, the ideas, the desires, the knowledge, the subjectivities of wealth concentration and the materialization of inequality. In a world, what does it mean to live in a profoundly unequal society for those who benefit the most from such inequality? What is fascinating to me is that you know, scholars keep repeating the stories elites tell about themselves. The only difference is that the morality of the story is indeed inverted. In very simple terms, we say elites are elitist. It is a given truth. It is obvious the elites are elitist. And when we say this, we assume for the most part, we're offering a critique because such reality is immoral, unethical, elitist, and racist. Along the way, it seems to me, we take domination as a self-evident and self-referential, and thus dismiss the elite as obvious actors in the histories of privilege and inequality. At the core of such argument, argumentation, a tautological assumption perpetuates itself. Elites, those at the top social, political, cultural, and economic hierarchy, dominate others in society, because they are elites and simultaneously they are elites because thanks to the elite status, they're able to dominate others, which means they benefit from unequal societies. Above all then, this is an invitation to question the, you know, to question the continuing confidence in these responses. If you don't remember anything else from this talk, remember this. My current research is an attempt to reconceptualize old, and yes, they are old and I don't care, but in the current political and global context, these are fundamental questions. If, as plenty of work have shown, elites have mostly benefited from a neoliberal political economy, how do elites legitimize that is to say, acquire, preserve, shelter their power and privilege? In a war, how do elites become elites? How domination happens? What is the moral economy of wealth and privilege and inequality? And what you know, does it mean to live in a, um, uh, in a democracy from an elite status that at first glance, to participate or be part of that elites and live in a democracy would actually seem is a contradiction in, in terms. 
So given that I have you know, time constraints here, uh, what I want to do for the rest of you know, the, uh, the talk here is to focus on the, uh, what I call you know, the class epistemology, the product of the, the work done by certain academic elites to see the moralized you know, narratives of a hierarchized, you know, following you know, three load of um, savage slot through which scholars have, let's say, you know, a sanctified a notion of the elites without history. That is to say that we know what elites do. We know what you know, elites you know, think, or what I just say that you know, elites are elitists. So let me then you know, focus on you know, the, the uh, um, and what I'm you know, looking you know, uh, 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 to do here is not just to tell you that all oh, the study of the elites are you know, Eurocentric and you know, we focus only on the United States. That's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is you know, in the creation of this hierarchical savage slot. And I know that it sounds like, what are you talking about? So I need to actually you know, offer all of these ideas, this knowledge production from the 1950s through you know, the present to see how that hierarchical savage slot is created. And that product of that you know, a savage slot, the creation of that savage slot lead us to you know, believe that we have to leave the elites alone. All right, so then you know, let's focus on you know, the 1950s and 1960s. After, of course, you know, World War II, there were some, you know, discussions of, you know, particularly, you know, a, a certain question that scholars, policymakers, anthropologists, sociologists, most of them at the moment, um, economic elites, is that asking some, you know, particular questions. Among them, in this particular context of, you know, the fear, the spread of communism, you know, decolonization, you know, process and different experiences in Latin America that were associated with you know, fascism or you know, the association between you know, populism and anti-democracy. All of these you know, uh, scholars throughout the Americas start asking questions as this. What were the most effective and appropriate ways to rule in democracy? Who was able you know, to be uh, effective in the arts of governing, governing and who should govern whom? And how should democracy look like in this particular you know, a, um, intellectual climate? We see then the consolidation of modernization theory. Some of these ideas were not entirely new, but I would argue in the 1950s and 1960s, they actually you know, achieved economic status. The question is very simple. How did they see the role of elites or what modernization theory a, um, define as oligarchical rule. And just to get ahead of myself, and some of you are, I'm sure that you are very familiar with this you know, term, you know, in the 1970s is gonna be, you know, the Lumpen uh, bourgeoisie. We will get you know, to that in a minute. Let me change it here, you know, all of you because I cannot see you know, the, the slide. So a, um, all of these studies, and I have you know, plenty here of you know, the name, but I'm gonna focus mostly on you know, the arguments. This you know, oligarchical rule was seen as the aberrant man manifestation of the de democratization. And we're gonna start you know, see the creation of an idea of Latin America as mostly two class society, a polarized you know, society. When I hear you know, the discussions about you know, populism you know, recently, I can actually you know, hear what you know, modernization you know, theory at its best. Similarly, all of these authors saw you know, the oligarchies as a feminist you know, force. And the main idea was that given that you know, Latin America was mostly a feudal society, you know, an industrialized and modernized one, the oligarchical elites were attached to nature, that is to say, to land. And the source of prestige, modernization theories argue, was indeed attached to land, not to, as we will see in a minute, entrepreneurial identities and you know, subjectivities. The other argument was that you know, the oligarchies were indeed you know, described as a bio biological you know, reality that were beyond history or you know, change. 
here we see then the role of you know the colonial background of you know the yeah you know the notion the, the role of you know colonial you know history which has to be you know different from as I will elaborate in a minute a um, uh, the colonial matrix of power which uh, simultaneously you know uh, translated into a vision of oligarchy as you know lacking economic masculinity or economic you know reasoning that is to say that privilege modernization theories argue did class privilege or the right to rule did not come for that economic masculinity but rather came from you know nature right so that was something natural to the oligarchy themselves and not something that it was actually you know achieved Right. Now what happened? Okay. So we have, you know, the you know the the, the questions of you know gender, and now we are, have the question of you know race. It is very interesting just to see that you know early economists, those who are going to actually you know become later the representation of neoliberal you know political economy, spent you know a lot of ink trying to figure out what was actually wrong with the oligarchies in Latin America. And there are plenty of studies. So here is not you know, the question of you know, filling a historiographical void. It's quite the opposite. One of the most discussed topic was precisely the role of you know, oligarchy. And then as they tried to explain why Latin America was you know, backward and under you know, development, they said that there was something unique, right? In terms of values and economic motives, of you know, the humanity that belongs to the West and the rest of the world. One of them was the racial heterogeneity of Latin America that did not allow you know, the emergence of entrepreneurial elites from false border to you know, a, well, you know, plenty of you know, sociologists and anthropologists and economists. They say that you know, an entrepreneurial culture that was of course you know, produced for, you know, from the lack of you know, racial homogeneity, most you know, oligarchies associated with entrepreneurial culture were mostly socially deviant. And that was the language they used. So it did create a culture of you know, dependency. Oligarchical rule of the elites were then you know, exotic. That entrepreneurial identity was indeed exotic, pirate to democracy and you know, exterior to a three class society, which by the early 1960s was seen as the representation of democracy and the representation of the United States and Western Europe. What were those you know, three classes? Of course, a proper elite, a middle class and a working class. Latin America was indeed a polarized um, society. I have talked a lot about the middle classes, so I'm going to skip that part now. Um, now, the 1970s and the emergence of a, a dependency theory. They did respond to modernization theory. And they say, well, you know, the three class society is impossible because, quite simply, they argue Latin America was no um, Europe. And here we see you know, the uh, canonical studies that actually, you know, they're gonna actually inform us. We will see in a few minutes how we understand you know, the elites. Dependency theories, and particularly um, Andre Gutterfram, which I'm sure you know, some of you are you know, familiar, proposed drawing on some of the arguments from you know, um, Latin American you know, um, economies, so economists from Latin America, propose this notion of, well, you know, this concept lumped bourgeoisie, which is a very interesting you know, concept and is predicated on certain you know, contradictions on how they understood the role of you know, the elites. It's not gonna be you know, oligarchical rule anymore, at least for the most part, let's say, um, but rather it's gonna be you know, this notion of the bourgeoisie and they're gonna put you know, lumped bourgeoisie. For Andre Guter Frank and others, the lumpen of lumped bourgeoisie was the, the Latin, what they call the Latin American character of the bourgeoisie. So it's gonna actually be you know, a contradiction. On the one hand, as it was the case with you know, the uh, modernization theory, 
it was a feminist, you know, force. And as you can see, you know, there in this particular picture, very, very common. Of course, you know, the notion of, you know, critique of the elites as a, you know, as feminine is not necessarily, you know, new, you know, uh, with dependency theory, but I will say, you know, they intensify that. And they would actually, you know, say that the, the bourgeoisie or the lumpen bourgeoisie, like the capacity and the political wig to become like European bourgeoisie. And again, you would actually think about, well, you know, these are just, you know, ideas, but there are ideas very much with us on how we understand, you know, Latin America. Um, um, so then, you know, as part of that, in the Colombian case, for example, they would actually, you know, say that a, uh, uh, the, the, um, the lump bourgeoisie in Colombia did not, you know, or were not European enough in that particular case. So why? Because they, you know, they were following their language, a, uh, the señoriteros or young girly men, the members of the lumpen bourgeoisie, and Colombia in this particular case. Just to want to offer an example, it was you know a nación señoritera, which a girly nation. It was not masculine. It was not you know a um, man enough to conquer that nation. I get it away from you know this feudal you know society. All right. So then, you know, and, and I'm just gonna you know, mention, you see, I have spent a lot of time in this particular picture and I invite everybody to see it, you know, here, it, because it's indeed, you know, the description of, you know, the elite. This is indeed, you know, the powerful narrative when we think about, particularly for Colombia, how we see, you know, the elites being, you know, culturally, politically, economically dependent from the United States and, you know, uh, Europe. Um, I have a lot to, you know, to do with this particular image. But in few words, what we've seen all of these studies, and particularly you know, this magazine, Alternativa, they spent a lot of time talking about you know, the elites. And what they did, they were impotent, backward, frigid, cold, and masculine, Right, and that the verb denote, you know, and all of this Latin American ca character prevent a bourgeoisie, a bourgeois revolution. So they wanted to be like Europe. The argument went, right, and in that process, then you know, a, unlike Europe, Latin America did not have a 19th century. This is the moment that the notion of neocolonialism emerged, right, and they were, you know, a. a unable to do that in this particular case because they were too European. So we see those two arguments together. On the one hand, they were not European enough to create you know, the, 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 the a, uh, democratic, the bourgeois revolution and create a bourgeois you know, democratic nation. And at the same time, they were you know, too European, too you know, dependent. Oh. And again, you know, we can actually you know, go back to this particular image you know, later because I think you know has a lot you know to you know explain this. And as I said, I am sure you must be thinking, but what what are you talking about? All of these ideas, what are they important? So let me show you how all of these ideas have become the dominant way to talk about Latin America, particularly in the United States. Uh, we say perhaps here in you know in Europe and. Partially in Latin America, you know themselves in Latin American, you know society. All of us are, you know, familiar with, you know, Ranajit Guha, and his powerful and influential book, Dominance Without Hegemony. And if you've been following the the the, the discussion with um, Shiver, I don't remember his first name. We actually go back to the very question of, you know, dependency theory, whether the bourgeoisie or the elites would actually you know, be European enough to create a, you know, a, a bourgeois you know, revolution or you know, bourgeois you know, democracy. So it has actually you know, become you know, a central part of our you know, way of how we understand you know, the elites. Of course, the Barton studies assume that particular question and quickly move to you know, rescue for, of course, obvious reasons, for good reasons, 
to rescue the stories and the histories of you know subartem you know peoples. Simultaneously, and maybe you know, for the 1990s, when real socialism was out of the picture, we see the emergence of you know post-colonial theories. And of course, I'm you know simplifying here for the sake of being you know brief. Then we see the particular, for example, you know, Spivak said that you know the elites would actually you know be part of or you know would uh, you know develop aspects of you know cultivated ignorance and dismiss the study of you know the elites. And finally, we have the colonial theory. And now I would argue this is one of the most you know, powerful ways of how we want to understand you know, the role of Latin America and other places, what is considered outside you know, the West. My argument here is that the colonial theory, and particularly Aníbal Quijano, the uh, uh, sociologist who coined the notion of coloniality of power, argued two things in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. On the one hand, he said that you know, the um, um, bourgeoisie in Latin America are a historical impossibility, and I'm quoting there. And on the other hand, interestingly enough, he said class as a category of historical analysis is indeed unimportant. We have to move to study race. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you know we actually have to study you know class instead of you know race. That's not the point. But I'm just you know trying to you know the point I'm trying to make here is that then you know the history of elites becomes um, unthinkable. Class become at least in the analysis irrelevant, and they produce a um, um, this notion of colonial matrix of you know power. What does all of this knowledge do at the risk of simplification, it creates a hierarchical distinction between the so-called West and the rest of you know, the world, in which the rest of the world is portrayed, again, at risk of simplification, three savages. This is the savage slot. And I'm following here, you know, trio. Uh, and his notion of you know the savage um, slot. Um, just let me I just want to you know read this. A, uh, um, so I don't need you know the, this is one of the central points here. Um, so again, at risk of simplification, we see then you know a noble savage, which is characterized or composed of popular groups who are either seen as naive. Or powerful that you know they offer you know or they you know participate in systems of domination and they you know exercise you know agency. We have the bastard savage, right? How they characterize you know Latin America and those are usually associated with you know the middle classes as the potential subject to create democracy, but always found you know wanted. And in comparison to the middle classes in the United States and Europe, they're always you know an illegitimate political force. And then and I don't know if I'm mispronouncing this word, ignoble, savage, an obstacle to you know, democracy. That's precisely the role of you know, the bourgeoisie. So then in our way, how we understand you know, these histories of you know, domination, we have two class you know, societies versus two classes society you know, associated with Latin America and three class you know, societies. Simultaneously, this then you know, create a vulgarity and here I'm you know, following uh, uh, Bembe, a vulgarity of you know, power and a properness of class domination. Vulgarity associated with the two class society that is you know, by definition violent. And then the three class society that is the way of how a proper domination work. So Europe remains then the model of how domination should actually work. What does this do? That then you know we see Latin America as the representation of subalternity, um, and I have no you know other way but you know to oops um, to to read this part because it's crucial and you know so this hierarchization of the savage slot does shape the very conditions of how scholars understand the formation of elites. 
two-class society is seen as particular, a system of caste, as oligarchical rule. And I think, you know, you could actually see that how, you know, uh, people in Russia are seen, or the rich people in Russia are seen as oligarchs, and then everywhere else are seen as, you know, billionaires. But that's, you know, something else, right? So, you know, we have, you know, that two-class society that is seen as particular, the product of system of castas, oligarchical rule, versus a three-class society that is seen as modern, middle-class, democratic, and masculine. It is through this framework that a normative idea of three-class society serve as the barometer for what scholars ought to study. The histories of domination are hierarchically ter 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 territorialized with the three-class society deemed properly democratic, superior, universal, global, a reality that can actually be exportable, a class harmonious, and legitimately violent. And those societies characterized by a struggle between popular classes and failed democratic bourgeois bourgeoisie elites deem less or anti-democratic, inferior, local, alternative, class antagonistic, and illegitimately violent, vulgar. In this context, Latin America has been often understood as the latter. The bourgeoisie are historical as either absent or as a transnational historical failure, unable to democratize their societies, that is, make them more like United States and Europe. In the process, I argue, we have created an imperial difference between the so-called global north, the west, and a global south, the rest of the world. Um, okay. So then, you know, this begs a you know, particular you know, question here. What is the norm then to which all of these characterizations and histories and characterization and histories are measured against? What is the reference to a norm that can evaluate the bourgeoisie in Latin America as violent? Um, so the so-called Western world model, imagined as a hyper-real Euro-American, is understood as simultaneously universal, unique, exceptional. And it is here where the, this thick genealogy that I could only describe briefly is mobilized to discipline what we say about the elites. What is considered local, outside that hyper real Europe and the United States, is often subsumed into a transhistorical, unpolluted, glorified, authentic subalternity positioned against a prevailing Western colonial matrix of power. In this framework, the elites are, in Latin America are merely a mimicry of global superpowers and their colonial matrix of you know, power. As a result, in a regime of knowledge, which is becoming hegemonic, the elites in Latin America or Latin American elites are perceived or more accurately disregard at best as inauthentic, Americanized or Europeanized realities and at worst as a fundamental contradiction or deviation from an exotic reality for a proper Latin America subalternity. Taking, taking these arguments to their logical conclusion, what has no option but conclude that the very reality of Latin American elites, however defined or experienced, is in fact an oxymoron. Who cares about the elites then? Um, so and this is you know, the moment that, and that then you have to say, once again, why do we care about to talk about the elites? Why you know all of this is important. Does this mean then that we just need to rescue the elites in Latin America and say that they exist and that they are part of the history of Latin America? Well, partially perhaps that's what we actually you know have to do, right? But that doesn't mean then you know that the elites that, you know we, we have to say the Latin American elites are have been as you know. Um, bourgeois, the uh, European and US counterpart? Well, there I would say an emphatic no. This is indeed my fundamental problem with recent literature on the history of capitalism um, and neoliberalism. Precisely because we have this hierarchical framework in which Latin America is by definition subaltern, because it's indeed you know, the product of this two class society, right? 
or the characterization of these, you know, three savages, you know, the savages slut, any historical actors that speak from Latin America are seen as subaltern. We are then now fixated. There is a fetish indeed with the idea of rediscovering Latin American agency to say that they participate in the consolidation of mixed economies, in the process of, you know, of consolidation of development and the consolidation of different you know, practices. Latin America yet again appeared as a laboratory that made it into a global discussion. They create, or they were part of the discussion of the World Bank, the international other international institutions, you know, and influence the US, US policies. All of these remained within the discourses of the savage slab. Our argument now is that development was not creation of the US, that neoliberalism was not an imposition by you know, the superpowers. All of this literature tried to you know, recover and even you know, reclaim an agency. And it's still you know, the West remained the subject whose other histories and influence matter. It is an effort to discover and acclaim a presumably classless Latin Americanist. And in the process, we silence class. They are just from Latin America or they are Latin Americanists and celebrate the elites because they participate in what is perceived, that is to say, participate, uh, I'm sorry, because they participate in what is perceived as global, that is to say, beyond Latin America. In that sense, then, you know, the elites get a free ride. So we must go beyond the centering the story of the elites, but merely recovering Latin American agents. And here is my main and perhaps basic point I want to show in my current book project. It proposes a different vision of transnational formation of the elites. It appropriates a provocative question posed by historian Gabriel Spiegel. In commenting on recent studies of transnationalism, she asked, and I quote, if not from the nation or region, society or domicile, from where does social identity derive its shape? And we may add, where are the multiple sources of, you know, where, what are the multiple sources of domination and where does domination find its you know, legitimacy? She continues, if we are at once citizens of the world, Right? And citizens are objectives and subjects of specific nation. How are we, how are the contradictions implicit in this form of multi-locality negotiated on both the individual and the collective level? Broadly speaking, I wish to propose that across the Americas and over the last half century class, and more specifically, elite belonging has been one of the major transnational political projects in which they have participated in multiple contractual ways to dominate the world and consolidate themselves as transnational and transregional elites. Oh, okay, so um, the final question then that I have, and I can actually you know, return here because I'm just running out of time, you know, as to why this is important for, you know, Colombia, the histories of violence, you know, there. Um, let me leave you with this particular question you know, here that you see on the screen. Can the formation of the material inequalities be effectively questioned without a radical critique of the transnational, transnational conditions of domination under capitalism in which the lead have been the main historical actors and beneficiary? If you don't you know, uh, get anything from you know, this uh, uh, lecture, please remember that particular question. For me, that part is, you know, the answer is obvious, but to show it is indeed, you know, difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, can, can you stop sharing your screen so that- oh, Yes. You, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was a, a, a great talk and plenty for us to, uh, to chew on. Um, so I'm going to open it up now for, for questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Or um, if you prefer, you can 
write your question in the chat. Uh, maybe while people are gathering their thoughts, I, I can start with, with, with a question. Uh, I was just wondering where, where, where the military fits in, in, in your story. Um, I, you know, I, I think one of the, the issues that comes up a lot in, in, in the literature as I read it, is that a specificity about um, the elite or the, the oligarchy uh, yeah. in Latin America is its relation with the military as a key political and historical actor that is absent in you know, those societies with the you know, fully formed three classes, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, and so, and I was wondering if, 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 you, if, you, if you factor in the, the military, then that also means perhaps factoring in some variations in the story you're telling, depending on the country that you're focusing on, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's a very open-ended question to you, but perhaps you can just take it and see where it takes you. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, and, and, and you know, and here is, of course, you know, one of the things I'm struggling with, and it's like, you know, part of a larger, you know, discussion is, you know, the fact that a, um, well, during the second half of the 20th century, which is going to be, you know, the main part of this history of, you know, the elites, and I did struggle, I must confess, on what to present, you know, here. And I decided to, you know, focus on what I just did, right? In terms of, you know, the knowledge that shape how we, we understand, you know, the elites. But the other aspect that I've been thinking about is, you know, the question of elite formation and, you know, democracy. And of course, you know, here for the sake of my argument, I could actually, you know, say, well, you know, the formality of having elections every four years in the second half of the, you know, the 20th century, you know, Colombia. But the role of you know, the military is very interesting because that's one of the groups that I could actually categorize as you know, elite uh, of, you know, in, I have, I'm, I'm working on religious elites. I'm working on you know, industrial elites. I'm talking about you know, the uh, financial elites and military elites. So then you, know, you actually you know, see how you know, the military didn't indeed you know, make the effort to uh, claim to be you know, a notion of you know, democracy. So that's the moment that I, you know, want to be able to connect to other histories of a um, Latin America by studying, you know, that elite formation from, you know, the point of view of the military. Of course, that's one part. And then, you know, the other part is, you know, the different ranks of, you know, within, you know, the military. As part of my earlier research on the middle class is something that I cannot, couldn't include in the book was indeed, you know, the formation of a middle class, a military, let's say, you know, um, a middle class that is challenging that, you know, elite, military, you know, um, Elite. I'm not sure if that's what you want to, you know, you wanted to go, Paulo. Uh, yes, in part, but but also thinking about. Um, I mean, I suppose you know, the, you, one way of seeing it is that you know the, the military are part of the elites, or, or depending on which kind of rank you're talking about. Um, another might be to see the military as as, as an ally of the elites that intervenes. Yeah. In, in the interests of the elites in particular yes. contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's, there's a very two different ways of, of conceptualizing the military's relationship with the elite, either endogenous or exogenous, right? And um, so it's just that in, in your presentation that, that the military, which in so many different Latin American countries in, in the 20th century is such a key actor, seemed, seemed absent um, and, uh, not, not least because in many contexts it actually takes power and is, yeah. is, is the dominant mm -hmm. actor. Um, but anyway, there are, there are some other questions in... Uh, well, there are know, that is, yeah, there is one that I think is actually, you know, with, with you, you, you know, you go into, you know, the, you know, the role of, you know, the role of, you know, violence. And, and, and for me, this is, you know, and I mean, I think that's the way I read, you know, your question, you know, Paolo. But, but, but we can actually come back to that because, yeah, there are some, you know, yeah. questions. So, that so I'm, I'm let me ready. pick up a question from Juan. Um, uh, I'll translate it. Is, is there a relationship between the armed conflict and the maintenance of domination by the elites? Indeed, uh, yes, there is. And, and again, as I was struggling you know, to you know, make the presentation, yes, there is you know, a, a, a close, intimate you know, relationship. But what I want to do is this. I do a couple of you know, moves, which again you know, uh, goes to the question that you know, Paolo is you know, posing. 
one of the things is that you know for Colombian historiography, uh, for for obvious and good reasons, we actually have plenty of studies of what I would you know categorize as rural elites. So one of the things that I want to focus on is actually you know urban you know elites. Let's think about you know financial elites, industrialists, you know elites. And my 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 main point that I want to you know to show here is that in most of the understanding of you know the, the, the political and the armed conflict, we usually see it as a reality of you know rural settings. And one of the, and, 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 and even you know sometimes what we see, for example, you know, the Commission de la Verdad and you know other studies, one of the main arguments is like, well, you know, urban realities is so foreign to the question of the armed conflict because it ha only happens in rural settings. What I want to show is when we make that move and start you know, studying a, um, domination in urban society, we then can actually see all the political implications of these forms of the domination, not just to maintain the armed conflict, but actually to legitimize that form of you know, conflict. So, my effort is, in fact, try to see you know, the different practices, desire, words that legitimize the forms of violence that we usually dismiss as a reality of you know, rural you know, settings. So that you know, the, the, the cities supposedly are, you know, they have a different story. So what I'm actually trying to do is to tell the story of domination through the elites, the urban elites, in order to make that particular connection, how that elite formation have participated and consolidated and indeed you know, materialized a form of domination. They themselves call democracy, but that has as a condition the exclusion of other social, social groups. So it is indeed at the core of what I want to, want to do. But of course, I didn't have the, the, the time a, um, to elaborate that part as I got to, you know, to focus on the knowledge. And it has to do with you know, Paulo's you know, point as well, right? You know, how then, you know, the military is indeed you know, used to perpetuate that form of violence. But what happens is that you know, when we only focus on you know, violence, that comes at a risk. I don't want to deny the role of violence and the military violence by any means. In fact, one of the things I want to show is that you know, for the 1980s and 1990s, these forms of dominations are going to be quote unquote paramilitarized. That is to say that you know, private uh, forces are going to protect some form of this you know, class um, interest. Um, but I also want to you know, see what else is there in the formation of the elites. And what is very interesting, and here you know, that speaks to your work, Paulo, as well, we see all of these social programs that all of these elites created. So I want to you know, historicize that part, but I also want to you know, offer a, an ethnography of the elites. That's a long you know, answer to the question that one asked. Thanks. Um, Magdalena has a question. Magdalena, do you want to, to ask your question or would you prefer that I read it? Okay. Um, so Magdalena says, I'm specialized in Paraguayan economic and political elites. I find it difficult to define Latin American elites as a complete and homogeneous actor because they really differ from one country to the other. Yes. In my case, Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, mm -hmm. and even from one branch of production to the other, rural financial industrial elites, even when they turn to have international interests. How can you overcome this complexity? All right, that, well, my goodness, this is, this is indeed you know, a, a great question because you know, one of the things that, you know, things that I, you know, I'm trying to you know, criticize is that you know, this, for example, this notion of colonial matrix of power, we definitely, what you know, Magdalena is saying here is like, you know, we homogenize you know, elites as elites. So I think, you know, I would answer like, you know, well, we don't necessarily have to overcome the complexity, but I would say, you know, embrace the complexity. And what I would, you know, do then is perhaps to think more critically about what we mean by class formation. So class interest, I would argue, and the multiple forms of moral economy or the moral economy of privilege and class status can be very heterogeneous. But what I have actually you know, thus far seen is that they are heterogeneous, but they also create what we may call you know, um, chains of equivalence 
you know, following, you know, uh, Ernesto Laclau in a different way. That is to say, they, they, they don't, you know, uh, homogenize all the instruments, but there are indeed, you know, connections that allow them to speak as a class in terms of, you know, political projects, in terms of how they think about the moral economy of privilege, which is a question we take for granted, precisely because we think, you know, wealth is immoral, and then, you know, you know, doesn't allow us to think about the moral economy of, you know, privilege. So we, I would actually say we can work in both, you know, um, in, 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 well, both levels. On the one hand, being very, you know, a, um, keen to describe all the, you know, heterogeneous interests of class formation, but also try to see what is, you know, what connect some of these, you know, interests. And here, I'm still working on a concept that I'm not entirely sure, but it's the notion of, you know, a hierarchical unconscious. It seems to me that, you know, one of the things, well, you know, for good reasons, and is that we think of, you know, class belonging as a, almost as a, you know, rational, you know, process, but there are some unconscious elements, desires, again, you know, moral economies, that connect people as a class, even if they are not aware, you know, of those, you know, interests. So we can actually, you know, work in both both levels. So uh, what I would say then is like, you know, rather than overcoming the complexity, is to embrace, you know, the complexity. Let me give you, an, you know, very briefly a specific example. Religious elite, for example, in, in, in Colombia, they, you know, they created what we call a, um, a uh, Cajas de Compensación Familiar. I have no idea how to translate that, but let's say it's, you know, indeed, you know, a social, a social program. And they actually, you know, did it in order to create an idea of, of discipline and, a, and what I call a neoliberal, you know, subject. And those are the religious elites that at first had nothing to do with the financial elites. That is to say those who actually created banks in the 1970s, thanks to this a neoliberal, you know, program. But that financial elites, expanded labor relationships and you know expanded the office as a, uh, a a center of labor and there you also see then you know the creation of these neoliberal subjects so at first they have different you know interests but then you know you see some connections so perhaps we have to see those contradictions uh, together thank you for that you know very interesting question Okay, thank you, uh, Ricardo. A any other questions or comments? Um, you can write it in the chat if you prefer. I'm happy to read it out. Uh, okay, Kevin, go ahead. Ricardo, thank you very much for your presentation. You start your study in the 1950s and understand why for manageability purposes, that's reasonable. But the, many of the elites that you're probably talking about have much older roots. Oh, yeah. uh, these are all conquest societies in the Western hemisphere. So what, what, what do you take as the legacy as, uh, running into the period that you focus on? Well, it, it is, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for the, you know, that question. As I said, you know, uh, you know as, as I want to do at least, you know, two basic things. On the one hand is, you know, this ethnography of, you know, the elites. One of the things I want to is offer, you know, the description of different, you know, elites. And one of them is like the one we can actually, you know, or what they, or other members of society call them, you know, old money of, you know, blue uh, blood, you know, money and things. I mean, elites, that is to say that come from, a larger genealogy. So they are not certainly you know, new, but I would argue that there are certain uh, new elites. The one that I was talking about you know, before, uh, financial elites, I think they are you know, definitely new, the, the expansion of you know, the bank system. So that uh, ethnography wants to get to that particular description and see all of these distinctions. But what I'm after is a history of domination that tell us about you know, neoliberalism. And that is why I locate the study in you know, the 1950s or since the 1950s. That's the second reason, because I, wanna, I want to see the you know, neoliberalism from above, 
because we tend to actually take that for granted. We know well then the neoliberals benefit, you know, the elite. So I want to do this, you know, from a above. Um, so that's the, the reason why I want to, you know, start in the 1950s. I mean, you know, industrialists, for example, come from, you know, earlier a um, period, but, you know, I think they changed their identity. They shared, you know, the political project or how they perceive themselves as a live, in, you know, since the 1950s. Um, the third um, reason, well, I have to say just because I want to be a, uh, a little bit more, <laughs> make the project a little bit more, you know, doable, Kevin, because otherwise it becomes, you know, way beyond that. So, you know, it's a little bit, you know, arbitrary on my part to say, well, you know, let's start the 1950s. But the most, you know, the most important reason is, you know, because I want to tell a history of neoliberalism there. But, uh, um, but yeah, but I need to actually you know, make up the book a little bit, you know, doable in that sense. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Yuri, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Yuri Gama. Uh, I'm a PhD student, PhD candidate at UMass Amherst. Abel, thank you very much for your presentation. That was, that was very interesting and, and captivating. My research is related to, um, I'm studying the authorities and elites um, investment, mass investment in affordable housing in Brazil, more specifically in Northeast Brazil. And what I've noticed was that it doesn't matter the party and it doesn't matter the kind of politician that was in power throughout the 20th century. Uh, it, elites and uh, politicians, authorities in general, and that involves like the experts. They were connected and highly focused on investing uh, time, money, expertise, and knowledge, and sometimes uh, communicating transnationally um, mm. with diplomats traveling from uh, Colombia to the US, to Brazil, in pretty much providing housing, cheap housing for the workers, for the working class. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in some way that involved, uh, although sometimes um, with, with the intention of promoting some sort of like, uh, uh, like an economy focused on mortgages and loans, it was also uh, a way of, you know, um, growing and um, solidifying the state. So it was like, you know, one way you see like, okay, let's kind of privatize, uh, the, like make, make the, the, the economy more towards markets and, and, so, and whatsoever. But at the same time was like, okay, we gotta make more uh, agencies. We gotta create more agencies in the state in order to uh, delve in, in, into this this road, mm -hmm. uh, I, I I don't know if I'm like um, too confusing, but I would like to know uh, what do you think about that? Uh, how do you see this? You know, this uh, not not so uh, black and white. You know, more like um, interconnected um, relationship, right? Um, between the, the elites, the authorities, and and this up and, and bottom uh, ideas, if how how do, how do you see that on your uh, in your research? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Um, well, this is you know part of what I'm trying to get at, and mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that a uh, and this is you know my my current research, a um was the product also of, you know, my study on, you know, the middle classes. So, and I work on, you know, developmental, you know, projects of the 1950s and 1960s, what I actually, you know, see in a transnational framework is, let's say, you know, a degree of a um, questioning and actually, you know, uh, removing certain power from, you know, the elites, precisely because of the idea that mm -hmm. I made in terms of, you know, modernization mm -hmm. theory. Mm -hmm. So as a person from you know, as a person from below, you know the elites did, did not respond. But I wanna, what I want to what I want what I really want to you know show with my study in the Colombian case is precisely how the state, and more specifically the developmental state, 
becomes regionalized, becomes you know class, and can, you know actually you know, becomes you know urbanized. There is a very you know powerful narrative in 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 histories of you know Colombia that the state is indeed you know weak, and that there are only you know benefit you know the the elites. There's partial truth to that, but what I want you know to show then is. The problem is not just that the state is weak, because when we say that we, you know, reproduce arguments by, you know, paramilitary groups who would actually say, well, the weak, you know, the state is weak, and you know, we actually have to exercise, you know, violence and everything else. But what happens is that historically speaking, is you know, the state becomes regionalized, and it is in that process that then certain working class groups, certain working class groups, are going to benefit to have access to you know, housing, for example, but there are always, you know, certain conditions for that, you know, access. And the main struggle, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, was that whether having access to home would make people middle class. It was not a given, you know, answer. So working classes would indeed, you know, define a particular identity as working class identity as they had access to a, um, a housing. And then you know another discussion ensued because all the practices that popular groups did once they had access to you know to group. But the question then is you know what kind of a political subject all of the developmental group uh, developmental programs created, particularly through you know housing. So there is a a new literature I'm thinking about you know the work of um, oh my goodness what's his name uh, Leandro Benmergi works on you know housing. And uh, in Brazil and Argentina, one of the things that he, you know, he shows that you know the class conditions that were implicated in that particular political project. But that's indeed you know the discussion that I tried to get at. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank your you. answer. Thank you, Jure. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, well, maybe, maybe I, I can ask a second question if that's allowed. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was curious, uh, Ricardo. I mean, you started the, your presentation with with a few examples of yeah. interviews that uh, you'd you'd done, uh, but then the rest of the of the of the presentation was much more conceptual. I mean, and and a kind of a critically a kind of yeah critically conceptual of, of how um, elites are, 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 are thought of in, in outside of Latin America and how they've been kind of um, thought of within Latin America. But it sort of left me wondering, uh, you know, about your primary sources, if you like, about <laughs> your, and, and your methods. I mean, you know, what, once you, you, you kind of, once you settle on, on, how you, you are going to approach the study of, of, of the elites. And I think we, we got a, an idea of, of, of where you're going with that. What actually are you going to do? I mean, is, is, it, is it more of these interviews with these you know, CEOs of banks? Um, the, the images seem to suggest that you are also looking at kind of you know, discursive element through you know, visual representation and, and, and so forth. But can you tell us a bit more about you know the, I, I guess the, you know the, the mechanics of, of the research that you're doing, rather than the, the, the concepts. Okay, no, definitely. I mean, one of the things I would say is that you know uh, my, my interest in terms of you know the conceptual you know part is because you know uh, uh, I mean it's like you know that I I I really want to you know see that the problem of course is not that we haven't studied you know the elite. That's what we've been you know talking about. Now, you know, for, for more of the, you know, methodological, you know, question, it, um, it's been, you know, rather, you know, difficult because given that, you know, a, uh, what we now, you know, assume, for example, in terms of doing ethnographic work, uh, which is going to be a central part. And that ethnographic work means interviews, right? A, uh, uh, life stories. But that actually, you know, brings the question of, you know, uh, of you know the ethical you know questions of how you you know approach you know the person who you are actually you know talking about, but that is going to be you know a central part. 
is going to be you know, an ethnographic work. But that ethnographic part will also have you know, a, a main part of you know, the publications by elites. And here is that you know, that conceptual part becomes you know, central to the story of you know, the elites. And what I mean by this is that, yes, elites are quite, you know, quote unquote, very private in terms of what you know, they want to be, in terms of how they protect their privilege and status. And yet, precisely because they want to show who they are, there is plenty of you know, biographies, paid biographies, or autobiographies. So I've been reading some of you know, them, and there you would actually see how they legitimize their what I call the right to rule and dominate. So that's going to be a central part. Reading, you know, biographies and you know, anti-biographies. You know, similarly, I also you know see all the publications by these uh, groups, what we call you know, gremios in in in, in Colombia. Plenty of you know material on that you know front. Again, just to see what kind of policies they're envisioning, what kind of political project how they justify you know, violence, how they support or reject certain you know, policies. So that's gonna be you know, the, the, uh, you know, the other part. But then you know, what I also want to do is to enter into the labor spaces that these elite you know, created to go back to Jury's question. You know, a, for example, SENA, which is you know, a, a major educational program of the 1950s, actually, you know, part of the dictatorship of Rojas Pinilla, and see how they envision that particular, you know, project, what the, you know, how they, you know, a, um, professionalize a, a working class, how they open up other, you know, job opportunities, and what happened with those, you know, um, opportunities, uh, uh, yeah, those opportunities once they became, you know, um, available. And, and I want to do that with you know all the different you know elite groups, religious elites, bureaucrats, uh, you know technocrats, a, um, uh, financial elites, and industrialists. I want to do with all of this in order to offer what we may call a thick, a uh, uh, ethnography of um, elite formation. But then you know the second part is the let's say the re relational you know part that is to say how do the elite a struggle with other groups. As I said earlier, one of the main, you know, interests on the elites came from, you know, from the fact that the middle classes became the representation of this three-class society, the representation of, you know, democracy. How did, you know, elites respond to that particular empowerment of, you know, the middle classes as the representation of, you know, democracy? And in order to answer that, then, you know, I, I, I need to actually, you know, see the class, class struggle through all of these, you know, uh, methodologies that I just, you know, uh, described. Great, thank you. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, I think we can we can stop there. Um, thank you all for for joining us this yeah. evening, and thank you especially to Ricardo for uh, his very stimulating presentation and uh, there's. Uh, a lot to look forward to in, in this project. Um, so, yes, thank you all. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave the last word to you, Ricardo, if you want to say anything. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, uh, we'll see where we go, you know, here, because studying the elites, and some of, you know, so many of you know, is indeed, you know, uh, uh, you know, difficult because of the assumptions I talk about, but also because, you know, it shifts the way how we, you know, we do in terms of, you know, methodology. So, yeah, I'll, I'll keep working on this and then, you know, we'll see where we go. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ricardo. And thanks to everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>